So this is really a three-act play, how to create safe software for automotive. And if, when you talk about safety-critical APIs, there's a whole gamut of them. It's almost too many. And it took, it took me almost three years to make sense of them. And there's ISO 26262, there's MISRA, there's AutoSAR, there's WG23, and then there's core guidelines as well, too. So I'm going to say a little bit about how each one of them, what, how, how, how each one of them work and how they work with each other. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about SG12, the C++ uh, vulnerabilities group, which has been um, um, additionally branded as a safety critical group as well, too, because that's some of the things that they they are doing. So act one, let's start. How do you create safe, automo safe software for automotive? Well, the problem, and so what is the problem? How can we help to make self-driving cars safe? Essentially, you're talking about t today, not just today's automotive system, but in an autonomous vehicle system, obviously you have to think about what the machine learning system is also trying to tell you, what it's trying to do. How do you make machine learning safe? I, I mean, many people, that is still such an active research topic. The top minds in the world, and some of them, by the way, are at Waterloo, University of Waterloo and University of Toronto, are, still, are deeply thinking about these kinds, of, these kinds of things. And the challenge is many, and I'm gonna talk about some of these things. So certainly the dream is to be able to do something like this. You know, you're going home, you know, you don't even see the, the road in front of you, and you might be work, doing some work or relaxing early, okay? But in reality, when, when you take pictures of people driving around, this is, really what they look, this is really what they look like. You actually see this of people on the road doing this. Actually, and this guy doesn't even have a self-driving car. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> If you're in the self-driving car business like I am in the, in the last three, four years, you will, now, you will know about the SAE five levels of, of, of self-driving, um, uh, of autom automation levels. Most of you guys are gonna have level one to level two, meaning that your car can probably drive along some lanes without your hands, your hands have to hover over the wheel. It will probably break because it's probably got enough sensors to sense that there's something in front of you, okay? Um, in, in, the in the United States and Canada, you have to buy a top-end car for that. In Europe, almost every car has that. This is what I find so un unequal somehow. So what people are trying to push for, obviously, is the highest level. That's past the dash mark. Level 3, level 4, and level 5, okay? So level 0, 1, 2 still needs some sort of human interaction. That's that uh, fallback, you know, you know where there's a, that, that little guy there that's saying, you know, the computer at some point is going to give up and you take over, okay? Past the dash mark is full automation. There's no fallback. The fallback is the computer itself, okay? Except there's one little case in, in level three where there's a conditional automation and the operating domain environment has one fallback that happens. We now know, so let me just, before I go to that, I'll just say that well, you're probably at level one or level two. What we're trying to do is get to level five, where basically you can drive anywhere, any condition, all weather, all terrain in self-driving mode. Level four means that you are shuttling around in some geofence area. Many places in Europe where you have trains, they're already doing that. You can shuttle around in your geofence area using taxis and, and shuttles and trucks. It's relatively, easy, relatively simple, okay? The hardest one is actually, believe it or not, not level five and not level four, it's actually level three. Level three is that twilight zone where if the computer gets into trouble at, any, at some point and you haven't driven for 99% of the time, that might be like six years or 10 years, and suddenly the window unfrosts up and there's a wall in front of you and you go, well, the computer says, I give up, I don't know what's, what's going on, you take over now. That is the worst possible situation. Most researchers in this field now realize that we will probably never have level three. In fact, many automotive manufacturers are saying we just need to just totally skip over level three because that is just the most dangerous situation you can ever be in. When you're piloting a plane these days, we know that if the pilot hasn't you know, piloted a plane for a while and it's been on autopilot, both takeoff and landing, it's actually the worst case of, pe of people crashing planes. Okay, they forget the basic training that when the plane stalls, you actually should push the stick forward. Every, some pilots are now constantly pulling the stick back because they've forgotten basic training aspects. This is a big problem, okay? So let's, let's do a recap of where everybody is. So Waymo, the Google spin-off, has been doing um, um, four million miles of, um, of, of driven autonomously. 
There's no safety driver that's in Phoenix right now. They've exited um, um, testing. Um, Uber, since 2017, has driven 2 million miles. Okay. And Tesla, <laughs> anyone here have a Tesla? Oh, nice. How do you like it? I love it. You love it, huh? All right. Don't feel bad about what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> They have done an amazing job. They, 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 they passed what's called the billion mile test. That is the litmus test in autonomous driving, which is that you need to have your car driven a billion miles to verify that it is safe. There's, there's some questions to whether you really, you really need to drive a billion miles, but that's, that's what people are now judging against. Okay? They have 300,000 miles, uh, 300,000 autopilot equipped vehicles. Okay? So how did I get here? I mean, not how did I get the CPP con, but you know, what does it take to drive a car? Well, you just kind of take what it takes to drive cars, a human, and translate it in the computer speak. You need some perception, you need to perceive things, you need to make decisions, and you need to change the control somehow, right? All right, so, but if I were a self-driving car, what that translates to is what they call localization and mapping, SLAM, okay? Where am I, and what does the whole, what does the map look like? You have to understand what the scene looks like. You know, which one of these things look like a human or a stick figure or worse, a pole. Um, you have to have movement planning. How do I get from point A to point B? You have to have some sort of driver state. What's the driver up to? Is he sleeping or is he smiling or is he actually paying some attention? Essential if the pilot driver remains in the loop. That means anything from three and down, you have to keep an eye on what the driver is doing. That's why now they got cameras facing you checking all the points in your face to see what exactly are you thinking about. And then there's safety monitoring, and that's what we're going to talk about. This problem is huge, and I'm only going to talk about safety monitoring because there's, there, are, there, are, there are many other aspects to this that, that we should talk about, but we're not. Functional safety, so in the safety world, I've learned that one of the key things is about functional safety. Okay? So that safety doesn't mean the system doesn't fail, it just means that it fails safely. It fails safely in that you can detect the failure in time when, and with a high level enough of an accuracy. Incorrect results and late results are no results at all. Okay? And you have to come up with some sort of a safe state to return to. That is what is essentially governed by ISO 26262. If you're in the automotive tool chain at all, making parts, making little piece of brakes, or even making the software, you have to conform this 26262. Except 26262 was written before software become, became really smart, okay? It's mostly primarily been for a kind of a manufacturing um, process, okay? There's also this uh, more overarching 61508 IEC. They're both basically the same thing. What they really do do, say, is they cover what's called systematic failures and random failures. I'll give you a demonstration of what systematic failures. You can read all the words, but systematic failures is a failure in, in design or setup. So I've got to set up a camera to watch for people, but yet I put some sort of monitor in front of this camera. That is a systematic failure, okay? You, can, you can't stop, you can stop this kind of thing, right? With good testing and good test documentation. Random failures that, that this breaking somehow, you know, after so, so many uses suddenly fractures. There's nothing you can do much to, to do about it. And really the only thing you can really say is that you have to find some, some way of controlling those failures, recovering it, fat, detecting it, and reacting to it. That's really the only thing you can do. With systematic failures, the only thing you can do is make sure you, you implement correctly. So how many people think that if I get all this stuff right, I get like a nice, a, a safe self-driving car? Nobody raise their hands now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're not even close. This ISO 26262, you think our standard at what, 700 pages is complicated to read? You should read this thing. It's got 10 parts spanning 450 pages, 120 work products. There are the results of fulfilling a much larger requirement. It's like a maze going through there. Any company who wants to make their product conform, to, probably, you probably have to spend something like over a couple of million dollars to get enough inspectors and inspections. And some of this has to be examined by outside to be verified safe. So, and even if you get that right, you're not going to prevent these self-driving car crashes that I'm going to show you. Now, I do want to say viewer discretion is advised. Uh, you know, if some of these images are going to be very disturbing, less so now without the sound. And of course, having said that, I know all of you guys are going to pay more attention than you ever have so far, right? 
whoever actually looks away when people says, don't look at it. All right, so this is the first, the Tesla's first um, self-driving car crash. I'm basically, I wanna go through each case and analyze the failure because I find that that's very instructive. This guy bought a Tesla and he decided to let it go and really, really let it rip. And lo and behold, there's this garbage truck parked on the side of some road in Shanghai, I think. And um, well, let's see what the problem is there. So this was a Model S. We equipped with a single forward-facing radar, a single forward-facing camera, 12 ultrasonic sensors using Intel's mobile eye, and implementing deep neural network for its object identification. It was also equipped with the automatic emergency braking system, but the AEB requires the agreement of two systems. Both the camera and the radar had to agree. See the problem there? <laughs> the driver monitoring system had consisted of some sort of torque sensors. Well, in this case, the camera and the radar did not agree on what was there. Next one, the second fatal Tesla crash occurred in 2017, May 7th. This is what happened. A Tesla was waiting at the intersection that's crossing up, up the screen. A truck wanted to, to turn left. I'm sorry, the Tesla is coming from the left down, okay? And the truck crossed in front of it, a typical left turn by the big semi Mack truck, okay? And the detection mechanism on the, the, the Tesla did not detect the truck, why? Because the truck was painted white. It looked like the sky. It confused the, most of the truck with the sky and said there's absolutely nothing there. Remember that Star Trek episode where they said, you know, sensors said there's something there, but the screen sees nothing? Well, that's exactly what happened. The rule, the rule, the rule of thumb there, guys, don't get a white truck. Tesla basically com com commented that the camera failed to detect the truck due to white color of the trailer against a brightly lit sky and a high ride height. The Tesla went right under the cab, decapitated everything from door up, and that's it. Third Tesla autopilot crash, 2018, January 22nd. Uh, by the way, before you think I'm saying bad things about Tesla, I have nice things to say, so just stay tuned. <laughs> this is a Tesla in blue that's following some truck in green pickup. And there was a, further on, there was a red fire truck parked there, okay? And what happened was, at some point, the green truck saw the fire truck, naturally pulled upside, and the Tesla accelerated into the back of the fire truck. Why? Well, there's this thing called adaptive cruise control. You actually have some of this as well, too, but it's not as smart as this, most likely. It sets some sort of maximum speed and some following speeds following a lead using the lead vehicle speed less than some max speed. The theory is that when the pickup truck changed lane to, because to avoid the, the fire truck, the sensors now saw a massively increased distance to the next object decided to command an acceleration to, to, the, to the vehicle. And that's what slammed the, the, the Tesla into the back of that fire truck. The system now actu actually commanded the acceleration. All right, this is the last one. This is the Uber autonomous vehicle crash of 2018 on March 18th. You probably have all seen, you might have not seen the previous videos, um, but you will probably have seen this one because it's pretty famous, okay? Uber driver goes along in night, crashes into somebody in a walking across the street with their bicycle. It's, this is what's gonna happen if we don't do things right. So what happened there? The analysis, accident analysis says that they switched off the Volvo standard Activa Intel Mobile Eye collision avoidance mitigation system, which would have initially detected the object at six seconds before impact. It would have decided that it was a bicycle 1.3 seconds ahead of time, plenty of time to start the braking procedure. Why was it switched off? Well, to reduce false positives. You know those things when you were doing tests, doing testings. To reduce interference with their software. You know what it's like if you're trying to make a right turn at Times Square in New York City? You know, you just 
You just can't wait forever. It's not gonna, it's, you're, never, you're never gonna make that right turn. So they also switched off the driver distraction detection system. So what's a poor autonomous vehicle to do in this case? I mean, you basically disable all of its capability to defend itself. Having said all that, I want to balance that many cases there have been of Tesla and Uber and other self-driving cars that have saved their owner from an accident or fatality. There's one case where one drove its owner having a heart attack to the hospital. Would you like your car to do that? I, I would. Another, it's, also, it's also a great thing if you're thinking, you know, I'm thinking my children are about to learn driving, you know, for a new or timid driver, uh, something like this may be, may be pretty good, right, for my, for my eager, over-eager young son, right? So getting too artificially intelligent with safety is a problem. Object identification is useful. You can help predict and plan in addition to helping partially meet some safety goal, for instance. And pedestrian detection is an example of how basically ML basically fails badly with the key requirement that don't hit things. Because with the AI and ML version, it's the case, if you follow how AI and ML works, is that if I don't know what it is, it's not there, okay? What really should be the safety version of ML is that I don't know what it is, but it's there, and I should, I should, I should take a safe maneuver. So, Although C has been the, was the predominant programming language used in the automotive industry when it wasn't, when things are, the components are not as smart as they are now, um, C++ is gaining traction significantly, especially on the infotainment side, obviously, but also, uh, but also on all the other parts, bits and pieces of this, of this basically a high-end supercomputer on wheel, okay? And most car makers follow this architecture with a system broken into separate components that, make, that perform sensor fusion, object detection, and maneuver planning. And there, there's also a discussion mostly in academia about creating an end-to-end -end deep learning system where object detection um, where, and control systems can be all fused together into this essentially um, fusion system with different cameras and frame captures and seg that detects segmentation, semantic segmentation, that means understanding what a scene means. That also there's 3D mapping, you know, the localization and mapping of where I am, okay? So the problem with all this is it's a lot of data being transmitted. Recent estimates essentially suggest that autonomous vehicle car sensors between the cameras, the radars, the lidars, the telematics, is gonna produce something like 120 terabyte of data per month. So if all 1.4, billion vehicles currently on the road becomes autonomous, you can see where that's going. If you, took, if you had to compare it to the cell phone usage, there are 2.5 billion smartphone users right now, generating two gigabytes of data per month, okay? And that's, what we, that's why the biggest challenge for the car companies are gonna be this idea that even 5G is not gonna save you. There are many types, so as a result, um, Automotive manufacturers are heading towards what are called AI accelerators, where they're specialized hardware that is designed to optimize machine learning AI. Essentially, that, all that means, all that gobbledygook means is they're gonna make it optimized for matrix-matrix computation. Because the essence of AI and ML is really about convolutions. And convolution really is just another complicated word for a small matrices that is tile to the specific cache sizes of your system, okay? And it's hard to predict the behavior of machine learning algorithms because by their nature, they're difficult to predict, okay? Um, by their very nature, they're basically opaque and they have to be validated and tested with a very, very large data set. And how much data is enough to say that a vehicle is safe for our roads? Should a vehicle be tested for a billion miles before they're demand, deemed to be safe? This is something that is def definitely deeply debated and there's not an easy answer. So the trouble with AI and safety critical system is obviously there's all these very possible variations that you may want to detect. I've, I've, this is the part that it gets pretty funny because uh, the, the things that they show up, they, they throw up is pretty interesting. Now what is happening is that beyond this idea of systematic safety and functional safety that I talked about, we're now beginning to understand what it takes to make, to solve some of those self-driving car crashes. We have to say, talk about what's called the safety of the intended function. In, the, in our industry, we call it SOTIF. It's basically how do you intend something to behave. SOTIF basically intends to address sensor limitations and things that could happen in the environment. Now, there's, they always have these very complicated environments. Those guys are really smart. 
much smarter than me, so I'm not going to walk through this diagram, but I'm going to show you this diagram, which I found finally made everything clear to me. You see, with ISO 26262, you would deal with what's called functional safety on the very left end. Okay? That's any internal components that could malfunction or some sort of generate some sort of electronic component unit failures because of the design somehow. But it does not solve problems if there's like an environment or weather situation or when there's an, an, intense, an intended usage, a misuse of the system as demonstrated by those four Tesla and Uber um, cr uh, crash cases. Those cases fall completely outside of ISO 262. There's nothing wrong with the design of the car. Nothing's failing. Somebody just turned it off. I mean, come on. So there's a new standard called SOTIF that is trying to deal with the middle two boxes, okay? And then there's also, that's not the end of the story, there's a final standard that talks about intentional malicious tampering, that's cybersecurity, we're not gonna cover that. But clearly you can see that this is a layer security issue that is any one particular part or group cannot solve alone, but we have to work together. So sort of basically categorize state driving scenarios these four things. It's pretty easy to understand. You have something that is known to be safe, that's area one. You have something that is known to be hazardous. That's area two. Then there's the unknowns. Something that you didn't know but was safe, false positive. Okay, that's okay. Your system's pretty robust, handles it. And then finally, the black swan. Something that you didn't know is unsafe. Um, I forget, what's his name? Dick Cheney, I guess. Sorry to, to bring up his name. Sorry? Sorry? Yes talked about the idea of known unknowns and the unknown unknown and the, the known unknowns of when he talked about the Iraqi, you know, um, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Apparently, now we now know really what it really was about. But this is what it is. If you're in area one and two, the known safe and unknown, uns the, the known unsafe category, you're talking about things like weather conditions, the infrastructure, for instance, in Canada, there's a lot of snow on the ground. And it's gonna cover up the lane markings the driver behavior, you know, the sun in your eyes. This is nothing wrong with the design. It's a, it's an, it's an, in, it's a failure of the intended function, okay? And this is an area that we're emerging that we need to define well. And there's a, there's a new ISO standard that's working in this area. I'm leading the team that is going through that area. How about these two? What do you think this is? Should I stop the car in the, in the left case? Do you guys know what that is? Apparently, there might be a child about to cross the road grabbing a ball, but on closer examination, it's actually painted into the road. So I really, sh I don't know, should I stop the car? <laughs> I have no idea if I crash into this thing, whether it's gonna be safe or unsafe, this giant dog, okay? So, and is this lady crossing? Could you tell from the intention what she's about to do? If you live in Toronto, you know what the next slide looks like. This is what traffic light looks like in Toronto where I come from. This is what it looked like when I was coming to CPPCon in Toronto. And then there's the unknown unsafe case. This is an edge case. What should I do? Should I stop the car? Do I see this on the road? And then finally, I love this one. <laughs> this guy is never going anywhere. If you have an autonomous vehicle in your neighborhood, just go and draw a white circle around it. So you begin with a safe and secure process. You try to identify defects early in the development cycle. That's normal. We're all in the software industry. We know this is what we do. We use coding guidelines or safe and secure tool chain or runtime or API. And this is well, well established for CPUs. But for machine learning and AI, they don't use CPUs. What do they use? They use GPUs, FPGAs, multiprocessor socks that are masquerading as AI chips. The ability to test um, these kinds of things on these kinds of unique hardware is somewhat unknown. In fact, it's pretty much, un pretty much unknown. Some people like our company and a few other companies are working deeply in this area and it's trying to define where, where these are. So now it's time to look at act two. What are these, these things? Obviously, if you're gonna do something, you, you see what's come ahead. Let me tell you something. We do a lot of work with coding guidelines, and that's a great thing. But coding guidelines, interestingly enough, defines what's the upper bound of coding. It's mostly trying to say that if you write your code above this guideline, above this line, you have great and elegant code. Okay, we should, and we should all strive for that. 
it actually doesn't say a whole lot about safety, but by implication, it does. What the safety guideline people are doing is saying there's this lower bound, and below this line, you are writing unsafe code. Above this, you are writing safe code, not necessarily elegant code, but it's probably it's, it's safe. Now, this is, the, this is the, the separation that you need to keep in mind between what are called guidelines, coding guidelines, and what are called safety guidelines. So let's start with ISO 26262. Sure enough, they talk a lot about coding guidelines. There's a section there that talks about control flow analysis, data flow analysis, static code analysis, and semantic code analysis, and different, different levels of increasing um, safety um, um, level. So C++ has a lot of um, things that we've inherited from C, somewhat complex language and implementation variants, some unintended programming mistakes, no runtime checking, strongly typed. There's some loopholes, okay? But there are things that we need to know about C++ to help make it safe. And they're not there to create, hopefully not create different um, subsets of language, but they're trying to do this. They're trying to create a guideline below which you should not go under, okay? So there are, so to give you an idea how many there are, when I first started looking at this space, this is how many there are. Over time, I whittled them down to pretty much one or two that's really relevant, and they're mostly highlighted in red. I don't think I miss any. If I miss any, let me know, because I'm really interested in knowing pretty much every single one of them. Miss with C and C++, AutoSong, High Integrity C++, WG23, C++ Core Guidelines, SG12's vulnerabilities, C has a safe and secure group, Carnegie Mellon CERT, Joint Strike Fighter++, plus plus, Common Weakness Enumeration. There's a whole bunch of chrono safety ones and a whole bunch of new emerging ISO ones. What's really different between them? Well, one aspect that's different about them, I've learned, is whether they're automatically checkable or not. In the, in the industry, with the, the average programmer that's writing ML code in the, in the car company, they're not ne even, you, you think they're really like smart people, but they're not necessarily the best programmers in the world. You guys are probably, probably I would say top 25% programmers in the world. You're coming here, you're listening to this stuff, okay? The people writing this stuff are not necessarily that, and they cannot read through a 200 page, 900 rule book to figure out what, which one is safe against which line of code. They basically rely totally on automated checkers. So some of these, are aim to be totally automatically checkable. They feel that anything else is just probably unusable. I mean, they're usable in some different context and domain. So when we look through it, I can say that, you know, Misra aims to be checkable, purely automatically, statically checkable only. Now, there are some meta rules, but there are very, very few of them. AutoStar has a mix of meta guidelines and checkable rules. And when I look at a lot of these other ones, high integrity is also trying to aim for static checkers. WG23 is a long list of rules that's primarily for team leads who, are going, who wants to develop some new coding guidelines. They're not going to be useful if you're, just, if you're, you're in, the, in the dirt writing, you know, writing code, okay? Sorry, WG23, but it, it's still useful, right? Some, some domain it will be. C++ core guideline has a mix. You know, some of it is automatically checkable because it is implemented in the Microsoft, okay? Some of it is more meta rules, okay? Um, other ones are purely for standards. There's a mo and most of the other ones are mix, okay? And some are, and I think JSF is pretty much checkable rules. I've gone through them as well, too. The thing that we, I've learned is that this is really what the industry is trying to build on, is that despite Misra, and I would have to say, I, when I first got into this, I used to jokingly call it miserable, C++. And honestly, it wasn't that, you know, over time, I've gained more respect for what they're trying to do. And ultimately, what they have d done and established is that they were the first. So every other ones here pretty much is based on Misra in some way or another. Everyone wants to start with something that is already well-grounded. So Misra, what it is, initially took a huge hammer and kind of shut down major parts of C++ because, it, you know, better safe than sorry until they could really understand it. And that's, that's what's that's happening right now. A whole mass of us are now in Misra, um, helping them to understand, you know, what type erasure is, is, you know, 
what template instantiation does. Um, and and they're, they're, so later I'm going to show you that they're actually bringing the work back to the C++ committee, but that's what's going on right now. Every one of these other ones are all basically running back to Misra and say, okay, what are you guys are going to produce? Well, there's, a, there's just this one tiny, tiny problem. This is, they have a really old guideline. They started in 1998 with C++ 98. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, in 2008 with C++ 98, and they, C++ 03, sorry, and they haven't moved, okay? C is the same, it's, it's still, they're way, way back there. Now, let's step back for a moment and look at what's good in terms of C++ and safety critical. We think that, in the C, that C++ provide many facilities that make writing correct and robust code a lot easier, okay? Although, So for example, things like RAII idioms helps in implementing correct management of resources because RAII basically enables the implementations of smart pointer and that avoids a lot of pointer related errors. Okay, another important safety is basically, so basically what I've done is I've listed some of the good things that, R, that C++ has that we can leverage for safety. C++ also have some loopholes and it is a job, hopefully, either of the standard committee or the, or the, um, or these safety guidelines to essentially put a kind of a line on these loopholes and tell you whether you should cross them or not. Now, some of the things, I'm gonna pick one example here, is, in the, is actually part of the type system. So the type system in C++ has some loopholes that makes it somewhat easy to circumvent it. Um, and coding standards severely restricts, I'm sorry, the safety standards severely restricts the use of implicit or explicit type conversions like CAS, because these are basically what you can cause loss of information. The standard doesn't define, for instance, the fixed sizes for built-in types, making it harder to make portable code requiring fixed size integers, for example, um, to write these kinds of portable code. So here, it's here, for example, so in C++, what we do is we do all the arithmetic operations in either integer or long, depending on the original operand size. And prior to an arithmetic operation, integral types are promoted to int. So this can sometimes lead to non-portable code. So here in this example, what we have is that on a system where int is a 32-bit and short is 16-bit, the result's gonna be basically what you would expect. It's 80, it's gonna be 80,000. But considering that the multiplication that it's carrying out um, would both operands promote it to int. But on a system where int is just 16 bits, for instance, the result's gonna be undefined because the, multipli the multiplication is gonna be carried out in 16-bit, will overflow, and only the wrong result will then be converted to N32. So the plain, another example of this is the plain char type that's put, that, that is there, because there, we have things like plain char and signed and unsigned chars. But, so Misra actually in the left here, I've shown you that we have multiple cases here also covering things like the if-else switch statement, saying clearly whether, how many of these kinds of things that you could have. So these are the kind of safety net that safety guidelines are trying to tell you. We're not there, these guys are not trying to create a subset, and in so doing, I hope we're not trying to create a subset, as you can see from the diagram before. We're trying to create a safety net below it, which you should really think about and explain why you're crossing. So there's a few related safety standards, and I said, as I said before, they all essentially um, come from Misra in some way or another. And in the automotive industry, what's happening is that I've also mentioned AutoSaw. So you'll recall that Misra is still based on C++ 2008. Sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> um, 1998. Um, and essentially, it was pre-C++ 11. And since then, we've had all these nice things like auto, lambda, concurrency, move semantics template deductions, compile time if, parallel STL, and MISRA has not moved since then. Autosaw has tried to move ahead to 2019 and essentially capitalize everything from C++ 17 onward. So here's, a, so here's what's gonna be in C++ 20. You saw beyond his keynote this morning that concepts, ranges, coroutines, modules, reflections is in. In fact, I actually was hoping that we would end up calling this the co-release, the release of co, because everything starts with CO. Even modules can be called component in some ways. 
And I've heard rangers being called compass, so maybe it'll still work. But here's the problem. Which one of these safety standards to choose? Well, there seems to be two bifurcations. You can either be safe, but not in C++ 11, 14, 17. Joint Strike Fighter was done before these guys, so, and it was actually done by help, with the help of Biana. And Misra is also totally pre-C++ 11. You can be C++ 11, 14, and 17, but you're not safe. So you have things like high integrity C++, um, search standard, the C++ core guideline. C++ CG is probably the one guideline that is constantly moving to the latest standard all the time, okay? And then there's also WG23's vulnerability. These guys are all constantly moving ahead, but they're not necessarily trying to be safe. They're trying to be guidelines. They're coding guidelines, okay? So in that box, they're kind of somewhere in between. So here's comparing the coding standard. This is what you have. You have AutoSaw, which stopped at 14. Misra, which, is, which stopped at 03, okay? But we are now working to 17. We have high integrity, which stopped at century 11. JSF, which was at C++03. Core guideline, which is constantly moving with the latest. And CERT, which essentially stopped at C++14. And if you look across these guys, you see that if you itemize these things, you'll see that they're somewhat, um, they're actually more similar than, than dissimilar. A lot of these generally have rules in, com in common with each other. And they constantly refer to each other as if by having references to each other, it actually strengthens the guideline in some, in some way. It doesn't, but it does help. But it does show you how deeply the base seems to be um, on Misra. So one thing I want to talk about in the last 16 minutes is that when, why does one aspect, why does Misra 2018, which is based on C++03, uh, still forbids dynamic memory? Because we've had many different kinds of memory management, like auto pointer, um, and then we removed it, and then we have atomic share pointer, unique pointer, share pointer, and weak pointer. Well, it turns out that this is actually a key area that we need to solve in this industry. Because in terms of things like memory management, um, even Autosaw has accepted that you have to have memory management in some way. They call that there's a, adaptive Autosaw. Because in that same pictures I've shown you, where is the auto, where is the memory management? Well, it's basically everywhere. Every embedded software safety standard, for some reason these days, it forbid dynamic memory management, and there's good reason for that. I'll explain why. And there's a reasonable requirement for embedded safety critical systems because the dynamic heap allocation is going to lead to, could lead to things like memory leaks, data inconsistencies, memory exhaustion, um, heap allocation errors and uh, fragmentation, some sort of non-deterministic behaviors. And this is the kind of stuff that SG14 has been dealing with. So in, all, in Misra, until we change it, it still says you should never use dynamic heap allocation. In Autosaw, they've created a lot of partial rules that enables this. So let's analyze this. Why do we need it? Well, we need dynamic memory because the size of data may not be known at runtime. The lifetime of data is, is independent from object lifetime. There could be sharing. Uh, you could be doing type erasure. There could be some language library features that use dynamic uh, memory implicitly, like exception handling, containers, or std function. So, but, there, but what about these issues, like memory leaks, fragmentation, non-deterministic execution times, and out of memory? Well, it seems that looking at Autosaw as an example, what they're saying is that you should use to, to, uh, to prevent running out of memory, the application needs to do things like pre-allocate enough memory during startup based on its, say, maximal memory needs. Also, the memory management functions has to be executed without context switch and without syscalls to guarantee the worst case execution. Or in other cases, if you're using calling external C++ libraries, which might use dynamic memory management, um, dynamic memory operations, then the memory ma management module has to provide custom implementations of C++ new and delete. There are all these different ways that you can solve the memory leaks issue. If you have fragmentation, in, for instance, the allocator has to somehow minimize fragmentation, usually it's using some sort of OS malloc or free, or techniques that our implementations for custom allocators are generally available. For non-deterministic execution times, what you want to do is that the allocator has to guarantee deterministic worst case execution time, either using that OS malloc or you roll your own, or you allocate or deallocate only during non-real-time phases of the program. 
If you run out, run out of memory, what you should do is you should define maximum memory need using pre-allocated storage. So these are the guidelines that AutoSaw has advanced. And just like any standard, Misra is taking things out of AutoSaw and trying to incorporate that into the next revision based on what they're doing. So let's go to the final act, 13 minutes left. Let's take a look at what C++ SG12 is doing. I'm not the chair of SG12, Gabby Das Reese is. I hope he's at the conference somewhere. Um, I, although I participate heavily in it because I'm interested in safety, and right now that kind of thing is now processed through SG12. It reflects the fact that C++, and it's actually even in the, the, the directions group's document, safety is an important aspect of C++ moving forward in the future. So WG21, we, there was this need to reduce vulnerability. It started as a group to handle optimizations that can cause unsafe code. There was this, there was this paper that was written by MI, in MIT um, called Towards Optimization Safe System, where they demonstrate that certain types of optimization can actually cause unsafe code. Okay, wonderful idea there. So we decided, we started this group back in, I think, 2000, 2014, there and about, to work on this. And this seems eminently the right group when we started bringing in and wanted to extend it into 2070 Toronto meeting to help with other safety critical components, the documents like WG23's vulnerability document, like MISRA and like AutoSAR. Then since then, what's happened is that AutoSAR has developed their guidelines, which is a mix of guidelines and checkable requirements and matching up to C++14 and they stopped. They wanted to hand this document to us. They actually came to CppCon, came to the C++ standard and wanted to convince us to take over this document. That usually doesn't work very well, let me tell you. But Misra wanted it because what they have done is essentially take, take Misra and moved it up to C++14. So now what's happened is that AutoSaw, and I'm actually very happy to report this, is that AutoSaw has essentially folded their attempt to continue and move all their members into Misra. Now, there's a large part of AutoSaw that is still going on that is not involved with coding guidelines. There's things like you know specifications, the size of your disk breaks, and things like that. That's not of interest to us. But what's happening now is that with SG12, the charter has now changed um, and augmented to work on initially um, um, WG23, which is this other ISO group that has created vulnerabilities for C++, C, Ada, Fortran. But recall that this is these are not checkable. These are essentially a list of guidelines that some team lead could use to create a coding standard. That's useful, but not particularly useful for self-driving cars. So what they're doing, what we're doing is we have now fed back quite a few rules. Um, I think there was like five rules that we're feeding back into the C++ core guidelines as we're discussing this. Right? And the next thing we would want to do is essentially try to bring Misra in. And that's actually going to happen in the next meeting. So going back to this diagram, you see that essentially what we're doing is that if we have an upper bound, that's great because there's guidance that says everything above this line generally is great, elegant code. Safety guideline provides that lower bound that says everything below this is unsafe. Everything above this, this is safe, but it may not be great code. Okay. So the future, what we're looking towards is Misra remains a core because over time I've given up at trying to, to not use Misra. If you're gonna do anything safe in this domain, you have to somehow always end up with that core. But now, there are all these other players around that AutoSaw has folded into Misra. We're still feeding back into the C++ core guidelines. There are these other groups. You guys saw the Kronos Quiet Room. Kronos is actively getting involved with safety because they are one of the primary self-driving car um, organizations involved with machine learning. And groups like OpenCL and Sicko and Vulkan now have a safety critical part of it. Okay. Now you might wonder, what does a graphic standard, Vulcan is primarily a graphic standard, okay, has to do with safety. Believe it or not, what these guys are doing is these graphic standards are slowly turning into compute standards because of the vast demand of using these graphics capabilities married with GPU chips, uh, chips, AI chips, which are essentially like graphics processors so that they can be used to program, for instance, avionics systems. So as a result, they're demanding far greater compute um, interfaces on top of that graphics interface. Let's keep going. What is still missing? Having been in this thing for a couple of years now, I'm both excited and appalled at where we are. Excited because I feel like, okay, at least there's a base and I'm slowly pulling in all the key players 
and it's, it's happening. People are actually listening to me. That's pretty rare. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's still not good enough. It only deals with sequential code. This is all I found. Virtually none of the standard, with the exception of JSF and integrity, high integrity, deals with a, but a few things about parallel programming. And that's really where the ML stuff comes in. Very few of these standards remain that deals with parallel code. Almost none deals with concurrent code. And absolutely zero deals with heterogeneous code. This is the next big problem that we're dealing with. Why is this a big problem? Because concurrency bugs and race conditions is one of the primary reasons that you'll recall the Audi unintended acceleration um, fiasco, where the final judgment was based on a shared global variable where it's not all vo always volatile. Very fundamental, very fundamental issue that could, not some, that could not go away and eventually, right or wrong, caused billions of dollars of legal damage. And it was all due to a concurrency fund. So the last thing I want to talk about is why am I here? Oh, so finally, that's really the end of my talk. And finally, the one more thing. Why am I talking about all this? Where's all my experience? Well, I'm the chair of the Sickle Group, and I'm also obviously uh, charting code plates, automotive AI acceleration tools and roadmaps. So a Sickle is a modern C++ with heterogeneous programming added. And we're now trying to do this into ISO C++ as, as well, one step at a time. Okay? There are two talks and a tutorial at the end of the week that we're involved with. But what it really is trying to do is trying to say that we want to use C++ the way it, it is used naturally, with templates, not like, you know, with massive capabilities disabled. Everything should work like modern C++. And effectively, this is what we're doing to add AI and acceleration. Now, I don't want to get into a lot of these um, advertis advertisement marketing type stuff. We are being used for many of the, the Renesis um, autonomous driving things. But one of the things that we are trying to do is trying to make sure that we have to add what our customers are asking us is to make the language uh, safe, safe. And for me to do that, I have to make C++ safe. But I also have to make the heterogeneous parallel aspect safe as well too. That's my, pro that's my problem, okay? And this is kind of where I'm trying to drive so that at some point it will pass ISO 26262, okay? And my roadmap for all of this is that of course there's a C++ mode roadmap you see that MISRO is frozen at 2000, in 2008 at C++03. Autosolve now folded into MISRO in 2019. That's a good direction in the industry. And we hope that somewhere around 2021, I can outfit SICL with safety critical features on the API as well. But only if I can make MISRO itself come up with a C++, because SICL is based on the latest C++. So I cannot use MISRO from way down here. I have to help create a MISRO that is C++ 1720, say, then I can retrofit that into the heterogeneous aspects for SICL. Now you see my grand plan. So that is what I'm trying to do. That is what, why I'm, I'm, I'm busily trying to do all of these things. So Mr. C++ essentially remains the de facto coding standard for automotive, and the base from which almost all other safety critical guidelines are essentially built. In 2019, MISRA and Autosaw integrated together. Now we have one less standard to deal with, Thank God. But there's still work because we need to add additional features for C++ 11, 14, and 17. What we have done, guys, is we brought, we, even though they have integrated, we have not brought MISRA up to 17. They're still using basically the old rules. We're adapting the old rules to C++ 17. We haven't added the new C++ 17 features. I know, I'm shaking my head. It is so slow going. Basically, they haven't looked at things like, what happened with Lambda? We're looking at what happens if you have a function, okay, and then now it becomes a C++ 17 function. So there's still huge amounts of work to be done there, never mind the part that I'm trying to do, which is to add the parallelism, the concurrency, and the heterogeneous aspect. And then ultimately, I want to drive to push SQL to be safety critical so that when you have SQL running in the car like this, we can have this dream finally. Thank you very much. I am actually about three, four minutes ahead of time. Are there questions? Addy? Do you have the background of the Yep. Right. One of the diagrams has an arrow pointing from MISRA to C++ because 
as we are processing rules, we undoubtedly find new, th why is there an arrow going from measure C? We undoubtedly find things that we need to process back into C++, maybe require a new feature, an attribute. And by working together as the two committees, and what's happening is now a number of us are also on Mizra. I am there, Peter Summerlot is there, uh, Lloyd Jolie, all of us are there attending these meetings, which is always in some small tavern somewhere in the middle of England. It takes me like two days to get to, okay? And we're do, trying to make sure that this stuff gets processed properly back and forth. As they discover things, they come here and we look at their rules and make sure that they are real C++. Okay, thank you. Next question, sir. Charles. I know you. Yes. Is it what? Yes. Yes. And the committee is open. Is part of ISO. Yes. And one of the things in our last discussion um, was actually what we were trying to determine how to integrate and what Mizra does. And we were trying to determine that what we want to help with that for is uh, the discovery of more features or to put it in our lives. So that's what put us last. Yeah. Let me, so let me shortcut to your question. Why, is it possible to get Misra into ISO? And I'll explain why. Misra is a very private organization. It costs nothing to join, it's like 50 bucks. They are basically run by all the tool vendors who are selling tools to the automotive companies. So they are, tool, they are tool vendor driven. There's a chance that they could do something that is standardized, but part, part of the thing that by being, be, remaining small, there's only like about 10 of, well, when I joined, there was five of them. When me, my, my whole team, and Peter and all of us joined, there are now 15 of us going to these taverns in, the, in London. <laughs> I have to fortify my liver every time I go there. What's going on there is that they, can, they, they don't have enough manpower, okay? And that's one of the biggest problems. Safety critical is, in fact, I find it's a really weird, weird animal. On the, on the one hand, everyone wants it, everyone demands it, but nobody wants to work in it. Okay. Every safety critical group gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because companies rarely have that long vision of saying, you know what, we actually need to send people over to do this work. Can you imagine trying to create an ISO committee? I, I've, I've created the ISO committee out of nothing before, and I can tell you it would be very difficult to create a, a, a UN that, that is universally interested in this. That's really the problem, I think. But it's a good question. Let's talk more, okay? Good. Next. Tang. It doesn't work, just yell. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I can tell you, okay, so the question is, what is safety with regards to heterogeneous? Well, this is assuming you understand safety with parallelism and concurrency. I'm not saying you don't, but let's start with parallelism and concurrency before you can get to heterogeneous. Because we've got things like race condition, non-determinism. Where's the, the safety issue in heterogeneous? Well, when you're dispatching a kernel to some other memory region, what if that kernel never gets there? What happens if somebody masquerades that kernel with some sort of signature? So there has to be ABI checked, it has to be checksummed. There's so many ways, more ways that it could go wrong on a heterogeneous side, never mind the fact that you also have all the concurrency and the hetero and the parallelism bugs. Pablo is nodding because he's beginning to say, oh my God. <laughs> Is this ever going to happen? <laughs> I've only gave one example, and that was the, um, the integer, um, short integer addition example and the if then else clause. I don't think a list of example example is interesting to the audience because it's mostly things that you could read about. But, but example is the one that I talk about where you add certain integers. Yeah. Next talk, we'll have example, thank you. So there are talks that are gonna talk, go through the example, 
Um, but I tend not to, I tend to just pick one or two that's relatively understood. So for things like if then else, they will stipulate like, like something like if you have an if and then, you must have an else, you know, and that they must be delineated by braces so that you cannot slip a second line in somehow. So they, they, have, they, have, they don't have rules like that. I now have been living in it for three years and these things are just sort of burned in my mind. But yeah, it's good, it's good to, to point that out, yeah. Another question, last question, I think. That's exactly the problem. So the question is, if you're working on this exotic end, will you, it sounds like, and, and I'm, I am, we don't have good debuggers. Um, we have to build our own debuggers for heterogeneous devices. Um, we don't have a great deal of ways of testing some of these things. Some of it has to be using modeling. I have to learn modeling now for, for, to, to, to figure out how to, how to handle these errors. And simulations is the other, the, the other direction. Instead of driving a billion miles, you could run the car in Unreal Tournament for a billion miles and get some, these, some interesting result maybe. So there are these other interests that people are going, going beyond the usual uh, testing methodologies to, to, to try to figure out ways of doing this thing. Modeling holds a fair bit of, fair bit of promise, but I'm not an expert in modeling, so I can't really say much about that. All right? All right, well, thank you very much. I hope to have more of this each year because it is interesting stuff. Thank you. Take care, guys. <laughs>